Genesis 3 is where we're at. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to just use your word once again as Moses has given us such great uh, insight here to how temptation works. And uh, we pray that you would use his words, Lord, to, uh, to minister, to teach us that we would not fall into temptation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's the fall of man is the message, but keep in mind those are uh, man's words. That term is not actually found anywhere in the Bible, but it's what we use to describe when Eve and Adam, the first man, the first woman, fall into temptation and through them sin uh, enters the, the world. I've got a, a, a little shot here. That's actually uh, Gui Lin, specifically Yangzhou, which Chinese consider to be the uh, most beautiful place in China, only to remind us of the fact that this is the setting that they're in. They're in the perfect paradise environment uh, when they fall into sin. They're not going through a troubled time, a suffering time. They're not feeling neglected by the Lord. Adam and Eve did not get up in the morning and have devotions. Their whole life was a devotion. You and I have to kind of get up and remember to and focus and try to concentrate on and so forth when we're praying and reading the Word. They didn't have to do that. They just, they had that kind of relationship uh, with the Lord. But uh, everything changed, of course, at this point. Uh, it's been said that they were, uh, their, their relationship was so simple but so magnificent. C.S. Lewis comments that uh, God came first in their love and in their thoughts, and that without painful effort. So a uh, beautiful relationship that they uh, have uh, and had with the Lord. Uh, now, again, what we're seeing here and what happens to them is important because Moses is basically pinning and describing to us the pattern of how temptation comes to us so that we uh, would not uh, succumb to it ourselves. He writes it out in a literary form that's real history uh, so that we would understand that it not only happens, it continues to happen and that it's universal. Now, Paul confirms this in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, where he says, no temptation has overtaken you except as is common to man. And that's kind of the, the key thing I want to speak about for just a moment. He goes on and says, But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So God makes a way, but temptation is common to all men. You are not, nor will you ever be, unique in your circumstances of a temptation. It's universal. It's common. It's the same. One of the great lies of the enemy, of course, is to say, well, you're different and you're special. I don't know if you saw the Charlie Sheen <laughs> interview of uh, this last week, but I'm laughing because it's like it's the epitome of, of uh, self-deception and so forth. Uh, and part of what he was saying, and if you don't know who he is, uh, he, uh, he gets $3 million an episode uh, to uh, be on a TV series that, uh, that you should never watch. It's just, uh, it's pretty vulgar and pretty, uh, pretty obscene. Uh, but nonetheless, he's uh, in, been and out of, out of, out of uh, drug rehab centers, and he comes back. He's got a big lawsuit now, of course, because they've, uh, they've fired him. He wants more money now. But I don't know if you saw the, just how many saw at least a portion of the interview with him? Not too many. Uh, it's, uh, maybe you should uh, go back to NBC or YouTube or watch it. But he's there. He doesn't look well. He looks like a druggie. I mean, just being interviewed. Physically doesn't look well. And as the interview progresses, you know, they're, they're, they're looking, and I think like the rest of us, looking for some amount of repentance and so forth. This would be like Michael Vick being interviewed after, uh, after his arrest and trial saying, I love dogfighting. It was awesome. I, you know, this, like, that's not what you're waiting to hear. You know? And that's what Charlie seen, uh, was saying. Well, what would your kids think of uh, you uh, in terms of the drug use and everything that you've done? Oh, they think I was awesome, man. Nobody could do as much drugs as I did. Did I tell you how much cocaine I did that night? And he's bragging <laughs> about about the amount of drugs he could take in one night and still stay, stay conscious and so forth. And he's bragging about his drug use and everything. And the bottom line, he's saying that, see, most people couldn't do that, but I'm special. I'm spe it shows how special I am as a person that I could do this. <laughs> it's really amazing that, uh, and of course, even the secular uh, people are, are just taken aback by his attitude. There's, there's even guys on... Uh, uh, comedians doing takeoffs now on his uh, his interview and so forth, but no, Charlie, you're not special. 
<laughs> we're all the same. We're all the same. And it's a mistake to ever think that your temptation and your situation is unique or different. Because I've heard it so many times, people begin to think, uh, I'm special, I'm different. God's word doesn't apply to me in this situation because of the uniqueness of who I am and where, where life finds me right now. There's uh, kind of two classic uh, films that uh, I think epitomize this. And, and keep in mind, I love movies. I watch a lot of movies. Uh, this is not a thing against movies. But I try to see what is the moral message being, uh, being spoken about. Now, a lot of you probably don't know a lot about Greek philosophy but you probably know two Greek philosophers, right? You, you, everybody knows who Plato is. Everybody knows who Aristotle, Aristotle is. Why? Because they made movies. Well, actually plays. They didn't have movies back then, but they wrote their philosophy into plays, and that's how they got it out to people. That's why people know who they are. You think there was more than two Greek philosophers? <laughs> There's a lot of them out there. These guys were the Steven Spielbergs of their day. And, and they got their message out. And, and that continues to be the same as well. I remember when uh, Dr. Zhivago came out, written by Boris uh, Hasternak uh, about the Russian Revolution of 1917 and the subsequent Russian Civil War, uh, made in a film by David uh, Lean in 1965. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's kind of a classic, classic movie and, uh, and great acting skills and so forth. Uh, very entertaining, but what was the moral message in the movie? The moral message was this, Dr. Zhivago, he's this guy that, that uh, the war just takes him up. He's sent off away from his family, away from his home, uh, becomes the doctor for, uh, for the troops and so forth, suffers through the winter, suffers through hardships and so forth. One terrible thing after another, very humble man, very likable man. And uh, life is so cruel to him and so forth. His wife, she's kind of aloof and, and uh, has lots of money and is away from all this, seems to care less. And then he falls in love with a, a young gal out there where he is, somewhere out in the countryside and so forth. And the rest of the movie is about their relationship and his struggle between the fact that he's married and has a family versus his love for this woman who really, truly loves him. Uh, and so forth. And that's what Dr. Zhivago is about. The moral message is it is okay to commit adultery under certain circumstances. After all, everybody empathizes with Dr. Zhivago and what he's going through. So he's unique in his situation. It's okay. Not okay. Not okay. But that, that was the message. And then you've got a little more recently the, uh, the 1997 film I think a couple of people saw this Titanic. I'm pretty sure a few people saw that film. I think about 90% of the people on the planet, actually, and, and, and uh, many of them four or five times. But again, what was the, the moral message of, of Titanic? Uh, it, was, it was simply this. If you're a young, single girl, then having sex before you're married is acceptable under certain circumstances. Uh, and again, who, who's, who's the players? You know, it's, well, you've got this young gal uh, who's played by Kate Winslet, and she's engaged, but the guy she's engaged to is aloof, and he's a kook, and he's, he's not anybody that you would like, and so forth. And so he's painted in this kind of picture. Why? Because that helps mitigate her culpability in, in what she does in terms of falling in love then with this other young guy. Uh, and so forth, and they, uh, again, have their, their relationship. And of course, it has no consequence, it has nothing. She ends up, at the end of the movie, you remember, on the deck of the ship that's over the area where the Titanic went down. And speaking of him, she says, he was my savior, the only one who could save me, and so forth. I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit, but you probably remember the line if you saw the movie. But again, movies have moral messages, and I picked those two to say that it's not true. But that's what the enemy says. God says all temptation is common. It's the same. There's no unique situations. And therefore, it's universal. And since it's universal, we can learn from what Moses is saying right here in this very critical area. Well, let's go on and look and see how temptation works. Well, the first three verses tell us that temptation begins by challenging God's word. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? 
And the woman said to the servant, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So the first comment is about the cunning beast, sometimes translated shrewd. Uh, it is the idea of being wary and knowing when danger lurks, it has nothing to do with evil. There's no connotation of ne evil here at all. And most writers, again, talk about the fact that this serpent cursed later to crawl on the ground, but this serpent evidently was like everything else in the, in the garden, was very beautiful uh, and, and so forth. And there seems to be no shock uh, of the fact that uh, he begins to speak to, to Eve. You know, Eve, you know, doesn't come running at him. Are you kidding me? There's some animal over here talking to me. You know, she, she, she has this, is engaged in conversation, has this conversation, and there seems to be something unique and something different about this creature as it appears and so forth to her. Uh, the designation, more cunning than any beast of the field. Now, again, what's uh, very clear, though, from the New Testament, Revelation 12 and 20, uh, is that the serpent is clearly identified as Satan. So whatever form he took or needed to to address Eve, he does it, and it's very clear that the temptation comes from Satan. We need to say that because there's actually even some Christians that would say temptation comes from God. Uh, no, it doesn't. And James makes that very clear, and we need to make it very clear as well. James 1.13, let no one say when he is tempted... I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Satan is the tempter here, and we need to make sure we, we understand that, because there can be times when we think that this temptation coming to me is actually coming from a person. Now, Satan uses his demonic realm and he uses people, but ultimately, when we are being drawn in and being tempted, and we're going to look at how we can know that's happening here in a moment, we need to recognize it's a direct assault from Satan to, uh, to us. Sometimes when we're going through something and, and uh, we're uh, maybe the way we're being treated or whatever it might be at work or on the job or somewhere else. We don't really see what's behind the temptation that's going on. And uh, uh, thought about the fact that I could um, have the, the kids bring in their little puppet stage and set it up here. And I could have got uh, one of the adults behind there as one of the puppets and in the middle of the sermon have them start mouthing off to me and getting a big argument. Could have gone over there and slapped the puppet around. And some of you are saying, I think I'd like to see that. But what would be the point of that? Well, it's the guy behind the puppet. It's not the puppet itself. But sometimes we forget that, and it's very foundational to understand what goes on when Satan comes to tempt us. Yes, he uses other people, but he is what Paul calls the prince of the power of the air. And that's in Ephesians 2, where Paul says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of men. Interesting, the early days of radio when uh, Christians were looking, pastors looking on going on the radio, they weren't sure how things would work out since Satan is the prince of the power of the air. But it's uh, not talking about the air we breathe, though that's the analogy. It's talking about a spiritual atmosphere. When it says he is the prince of it, it means he's the polluter of it. We would call him smog today, which uh, burns your eyes, makes it tough to see, affects your breathing. It has an impact. And he is the smog of the air in terms of the spiritual atmosphere of this planet. And notice what he does. He's at work in the sons of disobedience. Those that haven't come to faith in Christ yet, that's the reference. He's at work in their lives. He's at work against us uh, as, a, as believers in Jesus Christ. Paul makes that very clear. Further on in chapter 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and the, the powers of this dark world. The attack that is against us is from Satan. The temptation that comes to us is directly from Satan. And his MO, the way he operates, as we'll see here with Eve, is always deception. Paul in 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen, 13, 
It says, for such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. So uh, the challenge is, and the temptation comes from a cunning beast, which is identified as Satan. He's the prince of the power of this air. He kind of muddies the waters of the spiritual atmosphere. Paul in another place says he blinds people for, and keeps them from seeing the truth of the gospel. We need to learn to resist him. He is actually the enemy, and we don't do that, Paul says, through carnal means or means of the world, but through spiritual means like the word of God and prayer. And he uses people against us, but he is the real enemy. Now, if we didn't go any further, that should just be helpful right there to know that the people are not the enemy. We're to love the people. We're to love our enemies. And, uh, but we have to do battle at times and understand where the real fight is, where the real temptation is. So that kind of sets the stage, very foundational. We can uh, move on now. The challenge, though, notice, was against God's word. Uh, and again, remember that um, God has spoken everything into existence for them. He's provided everything. And, and again, the beauty of this place in China to remind us of that. Uh, all of God's word is good. He's provided, but notice Satan is so subtle. He directly attacks God's word, uh, introduces an assumption that God's word should come under some kind of judgment by us. God has says this, but let's think about this for a moment. Is that what God really meant? Maybe God meant this. Maybe we've interpreted this wrong. But, you know, see, this, this is the beginning. He's kind of baiting Eve. Will she go for it? Uh, as he uh, kind of begins to bring this up. Now, back in chapter 2, in verse 16, we have the phrase, God speaking said, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden. Now, in this passage, in the temptation, Satan says, did God, notice uh, Elohim, he drops the covenant name of God, the one that you have a relationship. We're not going to mention that. We're going to mention the God who's very distant from you and is only the creator. Did God Elohim actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now notice it's subtle, but God is saying, here it is, Adam and Eve. Here's all the trees. Here's everything. Everything you'll possibly need in this perfect paradise. It's all for you. Don't eat of that one little tree over there, though, but it's all for you. And Satan comes along and said, did God really say don't eat from that one little tree over there? <laughs> it's kind of subtle, but it's like, you know, you, if you had the, the money and the wherewithal and you bought your kid every gift he could possibly think of on Christmas morning and he got up and opened them all and then said, hey, there's one more thing I wanted. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's not too subtle. Uh, and, uh, and this should have been uh, as well. And of course, Eve responded and say, how could you say that? As we sang this morning, God holds my heart in his hand. As Annie's saying, he knows my name. He gave me everything. Look around. It's all that's here in the paradise he's created. God is good, and he's done all this for me. I don't know what you're talking about, because his word says this. But she doesn't do that. She bites, uh, and she begins to fall. It's very subtle. But in how it begins, it seems like an innocent question. And Satan must now wait and see the reaction of Eve. Well, notice that the challenge did not have an accurate response. She does three things, and the first thing she does is diminish God's word. Uh, again, he said, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. Now Eve, in her response, leaves out every. She's just simply saying, we may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden. She leaves out a word. Uh, and, uh, you know, Moses is so careful. And we talked early on about the literary structure. Keep in mind, Moses was a, a very brilliant guy, highly educated in the courts of Pharaoh. He knew how to write. He's being inspired by the Holy Spirit. All these words are very important. And we notice right away, Moses wants us to see that Eve leaves out a word here. Uh, thus, she minimizes the provision of God. She discounts the generosity of God. And uh, I just thought as we were worshiping, you know, it's so, it's so important that when we, that's one of the things that happen. I mean, we come and gather on a Sunday and we see each other and it kind of just reminds us of the faithfulness of God. 
you know, and the love that God has for us. And then as we gather and we worship, those songs that we're singing, we're going, yes, God is good. Yes, what God, and, it's, and, it's, and it's, we just need to be reminded sometime. Why? Because there's an enemy that's constantly saying he's not good. And he's kind of stingy and he's kind of holding out on you. And you know, you're not good enough for him anyway. And there's just this constant, uh, as we'll see in a moment, most of this happens not in dialogue, but some of the key points of it happens in, in Eve's own mind. And Moses lets us in to see the thinking process. And it's uh, critical that we understand this. She diminishes the word of God. Secondly, she adds to the word of God. Verse 3, but of the tree of the fruit, which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it. Well, God never said that. He said, don't eat of it. But she magnifies God's strictness. She kind of says, yeah, he, yeah, that's right. That's right. She doesn't go, no, God's good. Look at everything that's out there that he's created. That tree, that tree, yeah, you're right. God's kind of strict. In fact, he says, man, if I even touch it, it'll just zap me dead right there. God didn't say that. But, but she kind of begins to, there's a seed of doubt that's planted, and she begins to, to buy in it. Why? Because if God is strict and harsh, then again, like our opening illustrations in the movies, it helps mitigate her own culpability. It won't be so bad. Hey, you know, I, yeah, I take a couple of things from work once in a while, but they don't pay me for half the overtime I work anyway. Right? I mean, they are so strict and they're unjust. It's no big deal what I'm doing. Right? It's like the father that comes in and says, uh, hey, you know, uh, you and little Susie are getting a little loud here, or whatever, so why don't you have Susie go on home, you know, for, for a while? You know, that would be a, a good thing to do. And then she stomps into uh, her mother and says, Dad says I can never see Susie again. Well, no, that's not what he said. But, but we, we want to make it stricter and harder so that we can help mitigate our own culpability. And if we're, if we're going down that road... If we're starting to say that, I thought God was like this, but he's really like this, listen for a hiss. Because <laughs> he's real close. It's what's going on there. And, uh, and that's what we're seeing here. I know when we're going through uh, Jeremiah, it's like Jeremiah is, is predicting the judgment of God upon the Israel. They're going to go into the Babylonian captivity and so forth. But he's pleading with them. Again, he's known as the weeping prophet. And we've uh, just had a great time learning about him, this young teenage guy that has this tremendous ministry uh, for God and is never popular. And, and we have to stop once in a while as these judgments can seem so harsh in what's happening and say, what is God asking? He's saying, would you please stop lying to each other? Would you please stop stealing from each other? Would you stop burning your children in a fire to a false god? Would you, could you do, stop doing that for a while so that I could bless you? Oh, God's so harsh. No. What he's asking, and we've tried to point out, it's pretty reasonable, actually. And, uh, but we've got an enemy that would tell us uh, otherwise. And again, do we find ourselves overstating Scripture's call to purity, that it's unrealistic? Then we're, we're listening to the wrong voices. Notice the third thing. She softened God's word. Again, back in verse 17, but the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you, uh, you eat of it, you shall surely die. And she removes the word surely. In other words, the certitude of death is removed. She re revisions, she's a revisionist when it comes to uh, the word of God, and we need to be careful today. So the temptation begins by challenging God's word, and secondly, the tempter then questions God's character, and that's in verses 4 to 5. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. So the integrity of God is challenged, uh, you will not surely die. Uh, this is kind of a, a, you know, less subtle, more of a in-your-face thing from, uh, from the tempter, from Satan at this point. Uh, in the Hebrew, uh, the word lo or not is right out front. So it's, it's not, you shall surely die. You're not surely going to die when you, uh, when you do this. And uh, again, Satan attacked from the beginning has always been God's judgment is too harsh. Have you ever heard someone say that? I've read the Old Testament. 
Again, God's judgment is so harsh. Oh, you speak of the revelation. What's going to happen in the end? God is so harsh. Well, again, that's, that's, that's coming right, right from the enemy. Uh, Satan's method is clear. He offers a question based on a perversion of God's word. Eve then begins to question it herself and revise God's word as she recites it back. That opens the door for Satan to declare that God's word then is wrong. Eve is buying into it. Notice also the benevolence of God's character is challenged. According to the serpent, the threat of death was nothing more than a scare tactic. Hey, touch the tree, eat the tree. You believe that? You believe that? That you'll do that and you'll die? You think God's going to kill you for, for that? Uh, that's, that's not going to happen. Uh, and, but again, uh, attacking the, the integrity and the character uh, of God. God said that? Man, how repressive. Obviously, he's like jealous of something or whatever. I don't understand what's going on. That's the God that you, you serve? But it's, it's an attack against his very character. It's a slur, but Eve is believing it. We would say that the lie bore the lure, the lure of divinity as well. You'll be like God. And often sin or temptation has in it uh, the intrinsic spiritual lure. It holds what some say is the golden promise. Hey, you can be equal with, with God. Hey, you can make your own rules. You can do it your own way. Uh, and, uh, of course, that promise is still out there uh, and being spoken by many. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. Now, Satan always includes a portion of the truth with a lie. Would knowing good from evil make you like God? No, actually quite the opposite, because God doesn't know evil, as we read from uh, James earlier. God is holy, and God's righteous. He knows nothing of evil, can incite others to evil. It's never part of his nature, part of his character. It's just not there. So that's actually a, a lie, isn't it? But will you, would they then know good from evil? Yeah, they would. They only knew good at that point. You can you imagine every morning you get up and you're, think of the emo, just the emotional side of this, never fearful, never anxious, never depressed, never any of those things. They didn't know. It wasn't even in the world. It wasn't even in the database. Can't even bring, bring it up or think about it. So yeah, it's true. Part of it, their eyes would be opened. Would they become like God? No. Uh, but always a portion of the truth that's there. The third thing is it continues that temptation was a choice that I mentioned earlier began in the mind. Verse 6 Notice this is her thinking. There is no dialogue here. Verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, uh, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So again, very importantly, the choice came from an appeal to the basic needs and basic desires. <clears throat> it's very important to understand. Satan comes and he knows we have certain needs and certain desires that are fine, that are normal, that are natural, that are God-given. And he'll try to make an appeal through them. The physical, hey, it's good for food. The emotional, it's pleasant to the eyes. The intellectual, it's desirable to make one wise. Hey, it, you know, I get up in the morning thinking that I hope I get something good to eat today. I'm not thinking that, man, I hope I get some really... Uh, lousy food today. You know, I, I don't get it. You know, I don't get up in the morning thinking, man, I sure hope my back hurts today. I'll just really praise the Lord for that. I'm kind of hoping it doesn't. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we've all got some pretty basic needs. You know, I'm kind of thinking, I'm, I'm kind of hoping I'm not going to get more stupid today. I'm kind of hoping that I still got the same amount of brain cells I had yesterday. After all the painting I've been doing in the enclosed room, though, I think I lost a few. But uh, I just... The way I felt for a couple of days, I'm pretty sure I did. But uh, I'm kind of, these are all basic needs that we have uh, that are God-given, that are okay. And it's to those that he makes the appeal. And, that, that's an, and, and this is not a dialogue. This is in her mind. She's thinking this through in, in her mind. He's kind of put the seed out. He's kind of put the bait out. She could have at any point then thought back and gone, but what did God say? What does God's word say? But she doesn't. She doesn't ever, is this really right and true? You know, it's, we can be so deceived about with our own emotions, with our own intellect, with our own body appetites and needs that he makes an appeal to. But we've got to just step back and kind of engage our minds and begin to analyze and, and think through what's going on in my life. What am I, 
Where, where is this going? And, uh, and make sure that we're not deceived. Now, I just want to make one reference to a, a passage of Scripture that is sometimes tied into this. And we would say it's similar but different. And that's uh, 1 John 2, 5, and 17. Uh, because there's some, something that's similar, we can get the two confused. Let me read it, and then I'll, I'll, I'll mention it to you. Uh, here uh, in John, he's saying, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Okay, so, so what is that exactly? And again, he's not talking about whether we, we physically love this planet or not. He's talking about uh, the atmosphere and the philosophies and the things, the way people think that are out there in this world. He says, don't buy into it. There's a world system that's very different than that of, that of the Bible and of Jesus and what God has for us. And he tells us what it is. Because there's going to be a tendency to think this way. For, uh, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, living for body appetites, lust of the eyes, wanting more of what you see. The pride of life is talking about your vocation, your money, your house, your car, those things. You can take pride in those things. I know nobody does that. Uh, and is that not of the Father, but of the world. And the world, those things are all passing away, and the lust of, or the desire for it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So there's a world system that's out there that basically wants to pull us in. Does advertising guys uh, know, know, know about this? Uh, I'm, pretty sure, pretty, I'm pretty sure they, they do. They know how to make, make the appeal. I saw the guy that is the head of uh, Chrysler being interviewed. It was kind of funny. It was a thing on a car show, and they got a new car coming out. He's also the marketing director for uh, North America. But he's a French guy. Oh, that was a bad PR mistake right there. He's a French guy. So you get this French guy, French accent, telling Americans the kind of cars they should get. It just sounded funny. It just sounded bad. But uh, he's a marketing guy. And, uh, and they were talking about uh, their Super Bowl commercial, which I could hardly even remember. It was so memorable. But uh, they said, was that a big risk to do the Super Bowl commercial the way they did it? And he said, no, not at all. Uh, he said... He said, uh, the media in advertising is not an art form. It's a science. We know exactly what we're doing. We did all of our tests. We did our studies. We knew we would have a good outcome. I believe him. <laughs> I think they know what they're doing. They know what this says. <laughs> People are really interested and drawn into the possessions and, the, and having more and what I see and what I want and so forth. So you have that pull of the world that's different than we're talking about how Satan comes in. I think that would be too obvious. Satan comes in and tempts us in our basic, natural, God-given desires. I want to feel good. I, I, I want to, it's okay that if I want to, uh, you know, think correctly and maybe get a little smarter as I go along in life and, uh, and so forth. The emotional, the intellectual, uh, you know, the, these pulls that are so natural, that's the gate that he comes in with. The world says to live a self-centered, self-directed life. Satan also knows our basic needs, and he makes the appeal based on those things. The last thing about this is that choice was a direct disobedience of the, of the word of God. And this is where Adam comes in. Adam is uh, two things to note about him. He was passive in watching the deception. Uh, the text says that he was with her, but also uh, when the, the term... Uh, Satan refers to you, it's plural. And let's see, I'm pretty sure there was only two people, so that means Adam was there. So Adam is there listening to all of this in passive of what's going on. He too could have said, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, honey here. That's not what God's word says. God's word says this. God's word says that he's good. He's provided everything. He's not strict, nor is he stingy. That guy's assassinating the character of God, the God that loves us and gave everything. But he doesn't, does he? He's just like, I don't know if he was watching TV or what, but I mean, he's just like, he's just like, it's just classic guy stuff, just passes, checked out. And uh, what are you thinking about, honey? Nothing. You know, I mean, this, this, this is what's going on here. You know, it's like, uh, don't blame us. It's been like this from the beginning. <laughs> the second thing is Adam was not deceived by, by Satan, by the serpent. 
Actually, he had the powers of discernment that had been developed by naming the animals as God gave him sovereignty over them and so forth. It was Augustine that said his mental powers surpassed, by, surpassed those of most of the brilliant philosophers as much as the speed of a bird surpasses a tortoise. And again, bring it mind, perfect in every way, uh, and yet the guy is passive. He was not deceived. He just, he just went for it. Uh, Paul confirms that in 1 Timothy 2. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived. Adam, it was just a full-on willful disobedience that we see him go into. And then fourthly, the temptation resulted in obviously tragic consequences. Verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened. They knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And, uh, and certainly the the epic proportions of what happened as they deliberately, willfully uh, disobeyed God. I mean, Adam, at some point in time, I mean, he could have he could have done this. She takes the fruit. He says, "Don't uh, eat from it." She eats from it, and and I mean, if she drops over dead right then, he's going, "All right then, uh, okay, I I got, I got some other ribs over here. You know, we could give this another shot." Uh, he could have, uh, but she didn't, does she? Now, again, remember we pointed out in the Hebrew that God says that if you eat from it, uh, in dying, you shall die. And he could have said, you know, honey, you're not really dead right now, but I think you are. I mean, I don't really see it. You haven't physically died. But tell me, how are you doing? Because God's word says, if you do this, you're going to die. There must be something dead about you right now. What's going on? Because I don't really say anything, but I know what God's word says. I get that a lot. I read the Bible and go, I don't think I really see that, but I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. You know, we, we, can, we can make a decision a lot of times in the midst of a temptation to go, I don't really understand what, what I'm seeing, what's going on here. And I'm pretty sure God's word says this, and I thought it would kind of work out this way. It's not really working out that way, but I'm kind of betting on God's word because it's always been true. Instead of going, oh, I guess he didn't really mean that. I guess this is okay. So we, we have a decision to make, even as Adam had a decision to make there. John Milton in Paradise Lost, his classic work says, Earth felt the wound in nature from her seat, sighing through all her works, gave signs of woe that all was lost. And it was, as Paul tells us that, and as we'll see in the cursing of the ground, that uh, the environment, nature was even impacted. Paul puts it this way in Romans 5, 12, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So it comes to all mankind. A couple of things here. The consequences of sin had been denied by Satan. Remember he said you will not surely die, but they did. And that's, that's always going to be the case. Satan's always going to say there will be no consequences. Proverbs 7 is kind of the, the classic warning of the young guy who ends up uh, falling for the harlot or the prostitute, and she's out there uh, on the streets. Uh, it's, it, it's, again, is an interesting study. He's at the wrong place at the wrong time. But note, she says, no consequences. Uh, Proverbs 7, 18, come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love, for my husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey, and he's taking a bag of money with him. He's out there fooling around right now. And he will come home on the appointed day. I know exactly when he's coming back. No consequences. Satan always says that. No consequences. Notice also the consequences included an awareness of sin. Again, what Satan said was half true. They did not die that day, but they died in terms of their relationship with the Lord and, and what it was. The constant communion with God underwent a death. They did go to an earthly grave. They would need a savior. They would need their eyes opened. That happened. Uh, and from that point on, the knowledge that they sought, they got it the wrong way. They saw evil. They saw themselves. They realized the desperateness of their own nakedness before each other, sought to cover themselves. Their innocence evaporated. Guilt and fear gripped their hearts. And now they would, like you and I at times, would have to labor to love God and love each other. It wasn't like that for them before that. Eve goes down a road of sin. She minimized God's word. She added to God's word. She subtracted from God's word. And that left doubts in her own mind of the goodness of, of God. And it's very important that we don't go that way. 
I just want to wrap this up with, uh, with some thoughts, closing thoughts by Moses, the same guy that writes this, now at the end of the Torah, of the Pentateuch, the five books that he writes, is he still as keen on how important God's word is as he is right at the beginning? Well, he says this in Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Moses saying that the Bible and the Word of God is pretty important? He goes, yeah, I think I'll just like write verses right on the doorpost as you go, and I think I'll just write it all over your whole house. If you got to, Stick it on your hand and stick it on your head. Do something here, but make sure you get the, the word of God in there. And by the way, you've got to keep telling your kids constantly how often, when they rise, when you walk, before you lay down, pretty much all, all the time. And then before he's taken up by God and he dies and is going to be taken by God, not allowed to enter Israel into the promised land, kind of closing thoughts for Moses at the end of his life. Deuteronomy 32, 46, does he kind of keep to the same line? Well, he says, set your hearts and all the words which I testify among you today, which you shall command your children to be careful to observe all the words of this law, for it is not a futile thing for you because it's your life. And by this word, you shall prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. Is it a big deal? He says, it's your life. <laughs> it's everything. And then Jesus comes along, of course, in Matthew 4, in that temptation under which he could not sin because of, we say, his impeccability because he was God come in the flesh, but goes through the process that we might learn from him. And as the temptation come, what does he do? He quotes the scriptures every time. That's how he defeats Satan. And the first one, he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Moses says, it's your very life. And Jesus says, it's your food. We're not going to survive without it. And it's not going to help us if we get a little bit of it. Because <laughs> if we soften it, or we deviate, or we add to it, Satan knows how to come in and plant seeds of doubt in our own minds that malign the word of God, his character, apply to the basic needs of our, our own life, things that are fine. But he knows how to get in there and get something going and take us down to a, a path that he says there'll be no consequences. And there's huge consequences. And, and we, we, we've all sinned, all come short of the glory of God. We've all experienced some of the consequences. But we need to remind ourselves that how important it is. And I just loved it as we were worshiping. I just thought, that's what it does, isn't it? We just go, yeah, God's good. Those, those words of those songs, yeah, he holds my heart. Man, I'm glad, I, I'm glad I'm singing this. I'm glad I'm remembering this. And I think I need to, I think we probably ought to get together every morning before we head out. What do you think? Do a little worship before we start out. But if I can, if I can keep my thoughts on the Lord, it's a labor for me to be devoted to my love of God. It wasn't for them. It was just how they lived all the time. But it's worth it because it'll keep me from temptation. David said, I've hid thy word in my heart. Why? So I would not sin against thee. Well, let's